if, if it's 525 at night and I have 37 unread emails, but I also know that I want to get home to my family for family dinner. Mm-hmm. That's not simple anymore. Like that's a lot, that's a, there's a lot of layers of complexity into that. Like, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And if you are able to prioritize ahead of time how these things stack, well then mm. you don't need to make that decision at that point. So for me, it's always going to be, if a push comes to shove, if it, we're up against it, it's family's going to come first. Like it just, it is. So in that situation, I'm going to go home. Similar to that is um, Heather's dad, my father-in-law got sick a, a while back. And, mm-hmm. you know, I own a couple of businesses and I coach athletes. And I have a lot of things to do and meetings of the day. Um, but because I have that set up ahead of time, I know the priority when he got sick, um, I she called me in the car on my way to work, and I just without even th- I just turned my car around, and she's like, "No, you got to go to work. You have I know you have this, this, and this to do today." And it was like, "No, it's really easy, Heather, to do this. That will be okay. I'll just do. I'll, I'll get everything covered. Like as we are driving down, you know, to Connecticut, the next state over. Mm-hmm. So again, it, it it makes it really simple to make some harder decisions if you make the decisions ahead of time by prioritizing." We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stop. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. How are you, sir? Excellent. Excellent. We're doing excellent. Cool. Today we are headed back to our three by three. Our three by three is when I put together three ideas and challenge you uh, to give us kind of your three hot takes on each one of those ideas. And so today we are going to look at your three small things that CrossFit New England does well, Mm -hmm. three strategies for strengthening uh, our networks, and three ways to simplify our lives. So let's, as we always do, go first thing first. Three small things that you feel like CFNE does really, really well. Okay. Um, Cool. So CFNE does some things well, but it does some things poorly as well. And I don't want this coming across like braggadocious because it's when I walk in the gym, what I see is the things that we don't do very well and we want to improve. Um, some of the things that I think are worth highlighting and that I am proud of. The first one is, I'll, I'll combine this into two, but it's essentially our employees. And I don't mean like, mm. um, it's twofold. Our hiring process, I'm really proud of our hiring process. We really vet people very well. Um, we hire people based off of their character. We have a really rigorous um, uh, process that we go through to, to vet, and make sure that they are going to be the right people jumping on the bus. Um, and then from there, I, I think unlike, and certainly it was unlike when CrossFit New England first started, what we've been able to create is you can have a career here. Uh, mm-hmm. So unlike most gyms where you come in your personal trainer or you coach classes, and what's the next step above that? Well, for most gyms, it's to become a head coach. But in most gyms, that is also occupied by the owner. So essentially, there's no upward trajectory of a yeah. career ladder whatsoever. And what beyond, we've done- opening your own gym, right? Yeah. So you have to leave. So you have to open up your own gym. Yeah. So what we've done is we've been pretty intentional about creating opportunities beyond um, coaching classes, beyond personal training. Um, and- it's it's working. So we have people that you know, I'm you know really proud of. You know, people could stay with us for their entire career. And, um, it's that's a cool cool thing. I'm super proud of. Um, the next the next one would be also very kind of like nuts and boltsy is we program with a lot of intentionality, and that intentionality is to create horsepower. Mm. Now, that's like. I think a lot of people program with intentionality and they go like, okay, so I, if we did um, um, front squats today, let's do some sort of upper body thing tomorrow. And that's like programming with some sort of elegance and non-interference and maximizing. We do that, of course, as well, but we have a very simple and structured way that we do our programming. And we have certain amount of days, we do certain things. And this has been iterated over the last, you know, we opened up in 2000. 
uh, 17. I was toying with this stuff in 2016. So we've been doing this for 15 years and we've constantly trying to iterate and iterate and iterate. And where we've ended up is for our members. Now you can't, I mean like, yeah, some members want to get stronger and some members want to run marathons, but in general, we've kind of hit a sweet spot that we can program to hit the vast majority of our members goals. And what that means is programming to maximize horsepower. Now, you can, I mean, it's call that what you want, intensity, you know, um, wattage, anything. But what it really comes down to is finding out the big, massive movers. Like, so it, it's going to be no surprise, but um, in terms of the movements, so clean and jerk, running, rowing, pull up, um, burpee, box jump, like ha, moves large load, large distance quickly. So the most functional movements. And then from there, creating the right sweet spot in terms of the reps and the loading. So what that means is for most people, the loading parameters for a um, a thruster is 95 pounds for guys, 65 pounds for girls. And that rep scheme in the workout should be somewhere around 40 to 60 reps, which makes sense. Like frame, mm-hmm. 2159 mm-hmm. is 45 reps. So we've really kind of honed in on these um, programming for horsepower principles and um, it's, it, it's working well. So that's another thing I think that we have, have learned and kind of like, it, um, changed and, um, gotten better at over time. And maybe the let third me, one, let me just interrupt you real quick. Yeah, go let for me it. just interrupt you real quick. I was going to roll care. Patrick. We've talked, I know, I'm sorry, but we've talked about, we've actually did an episode. I think we called it like conditioning biased programming. Is that I like the word horse, horsepower more, like it's just, it's cooler. It, but is that roughly the same idea or is is the programming for horsepower even an evolution uh, on top of or beyond the conditioning yeah, that's, bias that's programming a, that we've talked that's about? That's a evolution beyond that. So cool. conditioning bias is opposed to strength bias. And we did a whole yeah, episode on this, exactly. but the idea is what a lot of gyms out there is they want to lift and they want to lift heavy. And um, so they'll do a lift before every single day. Well, what you're doing, what you do first is what your priority is, essentially. It's your most important thing. Yeah. What you're doing is there, you're flipping the theoretical development of an athlete upside down. And the bottom of the pyramid is nutrition. We should be spending most of our time on nutrition. Any gym that doesn't talk about nutrition a lot, all the time, is selling themselves short in terms of service they can provide. And the next one after that is metabolic conditioning. Then it goes gymnastics. Mm-hmm. And then finally, it's weightlifting. Not to say weightlifting isn't important. But it's not as important in the development of an athlete as their conditioning. And that's what mm-hmm. we we believe wholeheartedly. Now, this is the next level. It's like to maximize people's conditioning, what do you do? Because you could yeah. do, you could do so a violation of what I just talked about in terms of the sweet spot, in terms of reps and load, would be doing a workout in the workout. There's something that you have like 15 ab mat sit-ups. If you do a workout with 15 ab mat sit-ups in one of the rounds, that doesn't elicit any response whatsoever. It actually becomes an active recovery. Now, if you're putting in for active recovery purposes, I get it, fine. Most gyms are not doing that. So if you want to put in sit-ups in a workout, that rep scheme should be around 150. So it makes sense. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 of Annie has that rep scheme. Three rounds, 50 at a time, or one work at round of 100. Like You need to kind of understand where the thresholds happen both lactic, anaerobic, aerobic thresholds, and make sure that the workout is matching up to to get create the de- desired stimulus. And that desired stimulus should always be to maximize horsepower. The next thing that comes into play with that is how you score workouts. Scoring matters in terms of the way that you're going to maximize horsepower. If you have a workout that is um, like work rest, like 10 rounds for time with a minute rest in between, and your scoring is your fastest round, well, your every member in the gym is just gonna blast round one and then do nothing on the other rounds if they're smart and trying to get a good spot on the leaderboard, which they are. So what, what do you do in that scenario to maximize horsepower? It's either one of two things. It's either the cumulative time across all 10 rounds, or maybe you wanna teach pacing, which is a great way to create more horsepower down the road, and then it becomes your slowest round is your score. So understanding how scoring works in this and then understanding that the way you set up the workouts in the gym matters in terms of is everyone truly running the same distance? 
Because if they are, there is integrity to your leaderboard. If there's integrity to your leaderboard, people buy in more and they work harder. If they buy in, they work harder, their horsepower goes up. So it's understanding all these little nuancy pieces to how to elicit fitness. And part of it is understanding that's not just weightlifting, it's weightlifting and running and gymnastics, burpees, pull-ups, sit-ups, and then sweet spot threshold in terms of loading rep schemes, time domains, and then also understanding how you structure the workout, including the scoring, um, all takes into account how much people are going to benefit from the, the hour and that, that class takes. Got it. Okay. So staff and hiring, number one, program for horsepower. Number two, what's the third one? From day one, we were very, very, very intentional, Heather and I, mostly because it's who we are as people. Um, We created an environment where if you complain, if you gossip, or if you bring drama to the gym, you're you're going to you're going to stick out. That's what, I mean, it's like, Mm. it's good. People are going to call you out on it. Now I had to be very intentional with this in the beginning. And it became to the point where if I heard people talking about somebody that wasn't there and it wasn't positive, I had to be the really uncomfortable guy that would go up and be like, Hey, um, let's defend people that aren't present. Let's not gossip and talk to people to the whole classes about what gossip means and how it breaks down trust. And I'd be incredibly intentional with that. We, have bracelets that are made that say never whine, never complain, never make excuses. White bracelets for people that are watching. Um, Every one of our members gets one of those bracelets when they walk in the door. We have um, Eleanor Roosevelt's quote in the back room, which is small minds talk about other people. Average minds talk about events. Great minds talk about ideas. Just so again, like to just like be aware of the way we're talking about. Um, so that was one of the things that we were very, very intentional with, and we've done a really good job. And it's uh, I'm so proud of what we have now because there it is drama free, it is complaint free, and it is gossip free. Love that. Okay, those are great. Uh, next one: three strategies for strengthening our networks. So networks okay, just the, being you know, the, I, the, yeah. the people around us, the people we can work with, the people we do work with, et cetera. So here's how I'm going to interpret this because if this is networking in terms of like creating more contacts, I'm the last person on planet earth that we should be asking <laughs> about this. Because I no, which hate- is I, I, yeah, no, and which is why I wanted to ask you because one of the things I've always noticed of you over the years, of course, is that you do this really well. But I know that you don't do it with the intent of built like of quote unquote networking. So that's kind of actually what I'm hoping for is like your approach or your thoughts on the idea, knowing okay. that you're not going out there and, and handing out business cards with the intent of like someday I'm going to reach out to you and we can do something together. Yeah, it's really interesting that you think I do that well because it's, I would just like put this on my list of weaknesses. <laughs> um, but funny. it may it's may because it's, it's the approach I take. I I don't have a lot of interest in selling myself, selling my business, selling my services. Um, I, I'm kind of really turned off by sales in general. Um, and that's a little bit what I feel like networking is a little bit. And I just say, I'm not like the, the go out and make connections. So the way I take this is the people that you do have connections with, how do you, how do you improve your connection with those people? And this mm-hmm. is, I, I think that, so like, um, Here's a couple of principles that I've always kind of like, I, I read them somewhere and just stuck with me, resonated. And the first one is assume that the next person that walks through your door, that comes up to talk to you, that dot, 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 that you're about to meet, that you're introduced to, assume that person is going to be your next mm. dot, 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 your next greatest business contact, your greatest mentor, your greatest love, your greatest best friend, your great, like if you go into these um, engagements, these introductions with that kind of in the back of your mind, you're, you're, it brings this level of excitement, awareness, and you're really honed in on the present. Like if you were to meet your um, your your hero, whoever that is, I mean, you'd be so zoned in on that person. And that's kind of a, that's kind of a principle that's always stuck with me a little bit. 
it's something I definitely struggle with because, yeah, you know, when you're when you're talking to somebody, you're kind of there's that little thing that's always kind of like either like I gotta get to that meeting or I have so much work to do or but can you pull yourself back in? And if we're trying to create stronger networks, that's really valuable for us all to kind of like double down and give ourselves a a, a check in, and myself included, in a big big way. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The next piece that, which is also, and I, th- the, um, this is a little bit maybe it's a it's a combination between maybe like Chris Voss stuff, you know, never split the difference, um, yeah, and Dale Carnegie stuff, which is when you're talking to somebody in aka networking or having a conversation is be genuinely interested and the way to do that is to listen you know i I, we we've talked about this before but there's different versions of listening and people say like listen sincerely then there's like listen Mm -hmm. aggressively then there's listen intent like all these different but whatever it is like fully listen and then the next piece after that with genuine interest is um, this is Chris Vossing, which I love is, and Katrin does this so well, particularly in texts or emails. Um, mm-hmm. Say back to them in your response, specific words that they actually use. Mm-hmm. It shows a level of understanding and um, that you're on the same page. So for example, if you, you if someone uses the word, um, you know, for whatever reason, um, serendipitous or something like that. And you use that in your response. Like, you know, as you said, like, this is a very serendipitous, that brings more rapport. It brings like, wow, they were really paying attention. If they say, um, you know, I was struggling with, and they list out four different things and you repeat those four things back to them. Wow. That brings another level of like, wow, they were really listening. They're really paying attention. It's really easy for us to gloss over and, you know, Heather, my wife does this really well when she writes as well. And I think you're a great writer too. So I think it's one of the things that people, when they learn how to write well, which I don't do at all, I just go like macro and big picture. I'm like, <laughs> uh, and you guys, you, Christine, Heather, great writers go really specific. And when you respond mm-hmm. to these people, respond with the very specifics and the best case is their actual, actual words. Mm. Um. With that, if somebody, if you're, somebody's trying to bring, uh, somebody's, this happens a lot as coaches. You're asking somebody about, um, you're, you're there to coach them, make them better, and you're asking them about their daily nutritional habits or their sleep habits or how their relationships are. And it's really important for you to get on the same side as them, not to, um, um, think that you are on one side, they are on the other side because you're never going to get to where you want to go. Mm-hmm. So one of the easy ways to do that, it's so easy in, in a conversation where you're trying to persuade somebody of a better way of doing something. So somebody you're like, How, how's your nutrition? They're like, it's pretty good. you know. And they list out four or five different things that you don't think are pretty good. It's so easy to go like, all right, I see what you're doing there. Um, but what if we tried and try to eliminate buts? Mm-hmm. Um, and do yes ands. Someone says like, mm-hmm. this is what I'm doing. I'd be like, yeah, okay, that's cool. And what if dot, dot, dot. And you know, it's a little bit of the Socratic method. It's a little bit of the, um, in coaching, I really like ands instead of buts. It's also happens really mm-hmm. big with like criticism sandwiches, meaning like mm-hmm. it's what we learned as coaches is to say like, hey, you did a really nice job keeping your knees out, but you came dot, dot, dot. And once you say the but, it negates the previous. You did instead of you did a really nice job of staying back on your heels. And if we are able to keep your arms longer through the middle, you are going to PR the next time that you. It just brings more validity to like the belief system I have in you, and we're on the same side. Love that. Cool. All right, last one. Three ways to simplify our lives. Yeah. So I just love I love this topic. I am a mm. I love. I th- I'm a, such a believer in the power of simplicity. So we as human beings default to complexity. Our mm-hmm. egos love complexity. Our egos want a problem to solve because that makes them feel important. See what I did there? I'm good. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. Um, this is hard. I'm a victim. But we love latching onto something that's like, gives us something to fight against. 
Simplicity removes that in a massive way, which I love, but it's a challenge for us. I also love it for the power that simplicity brings. And, you know, from a brand or a um, leadership perspective, I think that Apple has done this better than anyone in the history of consumerism. You know, you think about like what phones looked like before Apple came along and it was, mm-hmm. um, I would love to say it had, you know, 10 buttons, but <laughs> it had the numbers and it had like 13 other buttons. And then it had all these menu screens and all these different Apple. There's, there used to be just one button. There's no buttons now. It's just a screen. It's like, it's incredible what they've done. And when you buy a, something from Apple, there's, it comes in a white box with a logo on it. Nothing else. It's so simple. And their branding is iPhone, iPad, iMac, iTunes. I, it's just so simple. Their stores, they kind of recreated what the, the retail experience is supposed to be like. Before it was, <laughs> I joke with my wife all the time about, um, oh, what's the store called? Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. It'll come to me. Um, But it's like this, it's so um, overdone. Like there's everything. Anthropology, that's what it is. Mm. Um, You go there, you don't even know what's for sale. I don't even know, like, I don't know. Is the (laughs) chandelier part of the store? Is that for sale? Is this this shelf, the the part of the shelf that's holding things or is the shelf for sale? It's like, I don't even know if like the table that has the sweaters on it, is it like the sweaters for display and the table's for sale? It's like, oh my God. (laughs) Whereas you go to an Apple store, it's, there's not even like, registers it's like incredible it's like so simple and because of that you know when steve jobs who who pioneered the simplicity um you know they became the the biggest company in the world when he was running it so i'm just a massive advocate there's a great book called insanely simple um i think it's uh uh like mc mcdougall mcsen mcdougall wrote or something like that um but right it's all about that so I highly recommend that book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Having said that, the question is three things that we can do to create more simplicity in our lives. Um, the first one is, to me, is routines. So I I believe that when you have a r- routines, what you're going to do is uh, ahead of time, determine what are the important things that you should be doing on a daily basis. When you create that, the routine, you no longer have to make multiple decisions a day. Multiple decisions is adding complexity. It's adding confusion. Mm-hmm. It's adding extra layers. It's bogging down the system as opposed to something that can run on autopilot. Autopilot is very, very simple. And what you're doing when you do that is you're you're uh, creating more bandwidth. You're creating more opportunity. You're creating more room to do other things. So what you want to do is get as automated routine as possible with the things that are going to move the levers for you as much as possible. So the things we talk about all the time, we need want to just autopilot the best sleep practices and hygiene possible. Mm-hmm. Autopilot your exercise, autopilot getting out into nature, autopilot um, some sort of mindfulness practice, whether it's breathing or journaling or meditation, autopilot your exercise. Like it's just going to, you don't have to think about going to the gym or going for a run. Like those are just happening. And that's a really easy way to simplify your life to make sure that those big, massive movers that are so important for us are just done. They're not decisions anymore. That's one of the reasons that, you know, we've talked about this before that we don't have junk food in the house. It's easier, it's simpler not to have it in the house than it is to have to make a decision every single night of whether I should have the chocolate cookie or not. That's complex. That's hard. That takes energy. So... Just this power of routines um, creates so much simplicity around that. The the next one would be, um, I'll, I'll call it prioritizing, which is sort of like prioritizing. Maybe there's overlaps in these ones, but like prioritizing your your mm-hmm. routines of like, and making the decisions again ahead of time. So we can create a lot more simplicity in our lives. If, uh, if if it's 525 at night and I have 37 unread emails, but I also know that I want to get home to my family for family dinner, mm-hmm. that's not simple anymore. Like that's a lot, that's a, there's a lot of layers of complexity into that. Like, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And if you are able to prioritize ahead of time, 
how these things stack, well then mm. you don't need to make that decision at that point. So for me, it's always going to be if a push comes to shove, if it, we're up against it, it's family's going to come first. Like it just, it is. So in that situation, I'm going to go home. Similar to that is um, Heather's dad, my father-in-law got sick a, a while back. And, mm -hmm. you know, I own a couple of businesses and I coach athletes. And I have a lot of things to do and meetings of the day. Um, but because I have that set up ahead of time, I know the priority. When he got sick, um, I she called me in the car on my way to work. And I just, without even, I just turned my car around. And she's like, no, you got to go to work. You have, I know you have this, this, and this to do today. And it was like, no, it's really easy, Heather, to do this. That will be okay. I'll just do, I'll, I'll get everything covered. Like as we are driving down, you know, to Connecticut, the next state over. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it, it makes it really simple to make some harder decisions. If you make the decisions ahead of time by prioritizing things. Mm. And then the last one is probably kind of the same shade of gray. And maybe this is all of tons of overlaps, but to truly know what it is that you're chasing. And of course, chasing excellence, you know, whatever it is. But mm -hmm. um, like, okay, you want more Instagram followers. Okay, you want to make more money. Okay, you want to get a raise. Okay, you want to um, do better in the open. Okay, you want to ask yourself why. Like, why do you want that? And when you ask yourself why, it's, it's one of the... Um, the methods for finding a purpose behind something, it's called the five whys. So I want to earn, you know, somebody, I want to earn a million dollars. Okay, why? Well, because if I do that, I'll be able to um, send my kids to the college that they want. I don't have to worry about that. And I'll be able to buy the home I want and be able to take vacations. Okay, why is that important to you? Well, because dot, dot, dot. And when I ask all those whys deep enough, it ultimately comes down to me to one thing. I really, really value freedom. And when you understand mm -hmm. what you really, really value, all of a sudden your life gets a lot more simple, a lot, lot simpler. Because the opposite of that is not knowing exactly what you value, what you're chasing. And not knowing is another word for confusion. Confusion is complexity. Mm -hmm. Complexity is the opposite of simplicity. And what ends up happening is you end up spending a lot of time Climbing the ladders that are leaning up against the wrong walls. You spend a lot of time putting effort towards things that ultimately don't matter. That is the opposite of a simple life. So yes, it's to that point as well, it's like you can end up, you know, it's a, um, I think it was Henry David Thoreau or it was, um, I can't, but he actually talks about this in terms of like, you know, minimalism in terms of simplicity. Mm-hmm. And his whole thing is like, you know, one day I was thinking about, and this is way back in the, wherever he lived, you know, 100, 200 years ago. He's like, I think I want to get a new rug for my, um, the entranceway for my doorway. He's like, but if I get a new rug, I then now need to get something to clean the rug. And if I get something to clean the rug, then I have to find a space to keep <laughs> that. And if I get a place to put that, and all of a sudden what he realized is he's giving up his freedom. And the thing he valued the most was freedom. And what he, he's like, it's going to eat up so much of my time. And we can be chasing things that are ending up taking us farther away from the thing that we are actually going towards, that we actually value the most. So if we want to simplify our lives, and I believe we do, what the most important thing to me is creating as much clarity as possible. And we'll never know for sure, but as much clarity as possible about what it is that we are truly chasing. What is our true purpose? You know, speaking of true I'm purpose, I'm going to give you a two oh, minute. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, let's uh, let's talk about purpose in another podcast because there's that's a kind of really fun thing to talk about. Okay. We, absolutely. I want to kind of wrap this up though. I want to kind of give you a two minute drill question. Yeah. Because almost every one of these answers to a T, in and this always happens because this is this is how it is. But in in these three relatively randomized. Uh, things, almost every one of your answers to a T can come down to be more intentional. Mm. And so my two minute drill question, and this could also, you know, we've talked about it a lot. Um, and this could also be a, an episode in and of itself, but a two minute drill version, where do you start? Where do you recommend folks start to be more intentional, no matter what it is, no matter if it's their business, their family, their own personal health, their, ex, you know, fill in the blank. What is in your mind, like what's step one to go from I'm just kind of feeling my way through this too. 
I do things, I do things uh, with intention. Is this moving you further towards your goals? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. That is intention. Is what I am doing right now moving me closer to what I am trying to ultimately achieve? Now, there should be a step before that of really getting clear about what your goals are. Really getting clear of creating, creating a real clear picture of what that looks like for you. But the intentionality aspect to it after once you've created those is remove anything that doesn't move you towards your goals. Now, this is truly like chasing excellence at its at its finest, at its root cause. This is what it means. And this is why you and I both detest so much watching like junk television. We It's like, because we just know at our heart that we are not doing that. Now, I think we both of us could get better at connecting with our spouses over some like mindless stuff, but that's that could be with intention. As long as you're doing it with intention, mm-hmm. I am sitting down purposely to watch this with my wife, to spend time with her and connect over this. I am purposely going to read this comic book with my son, not because the comic book is a waste of time, but because I'm trying to connect with my son. Be super, super, super clear about is this moving me closer to my goals? There is no standing still. You are either, you are walking on a path. Your goals are at the end of the path. And everything you do, every second of every day is going to take you one step closer to the goal or one step farther away. You never stand still. Are you moving away or towards your goals? That to me is intentionality. Love that. All right, my friend. Uh, Thank you. That was super fun. Uh, Thank you, everybody out there for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. Ben and I will be back next week for another episode of Chasing Excellence. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.